Maker is a decentralized thing. Uh, we'll get into what exactly that thing is here in a second. Um, there, and they are working to create a stable coin. Uh, that may not make, make much sense right now, but trust me, this is an interview worth your time. Uh, Kenny from Maker is much better at explaining this than I am, so let's get right into it. All right, so the Maker website, makerdao.com, um, it has a one-sentence description of what Maker is on there, and I think about every word in that sentence uh, warrants an interview uh, in itself. Um, so there's a whole lot to unpack here. We'll just start with the basics, though. I mean, Maker is a company, and it's a very specific type of company. Could you get into what that is? Sure. Actually, Maker is not a company, so that's a good yeah. maybe a place to start. So we originally uh, Maker the the platform is a it's a way of creating a stable coin. Um, but in the beginning, this idea was not incorporated into a legal entity. It was what some like to call a decentralized autonomous organization. Um, since then, there's been some, some developments in the community to around more structure, but the basic um, structure for the platform has remained decentralized and autonomous. So in that sense, it is a decentralized autonomous um, you know, thing. And what that thing is, is uh, so what Maker's goal is to, to produce a stable uh, cryptocurrency, much like Bitcoin or Ether, but uh, you might be familiar with uh, the price changes. Uh, right, that happen frequently and uh, with great um, gusto. Right, uh, so what we're trying to do is create all of those benefits that you get from a cryptocurrency. That's um, you know almost instant settlement, transfer it anywhere, global by default. Uh, you're in control of your own money, but without the price volatility. So that's that's the goal of Maker, and how we do that, uh, we do that with some. Um, you know, kind of interesting fiscal policy, and we can probably get into that. But yeah, so right now there's a foundation in Switzerland that kind of oversees the development of the project, but it's m very much community led. And then when the project does eventually, or the product eventually does go live, it'll be completely autonomous. There won't be any um, top down structure imposed upon that from, you know, like a, an actual legal company or anything like that. Okay, great. So um, back to the concept of a decentralized organization. So mm -hmm. how does. Uh, you said there's a foundation running things, but how does actually, yeah, I don't know, in the traditional sense of ownership, how does that work? How is one? How are members of the community valued in an organization like that? Right. So it's, maybe it's a, good to clarify the the foundation doesn't uh, run things. The foundation is responsible for producing um, a stable coin, right? So that's that's like um, paying developers. That's also. Uh, communicating with the the community because the foundation is the community for some you know or, or its core members um, so in that sense it's a representation or a manifestation of the community itself but it is um, legally incorporated in a jurisdiction and that's important because sometimes you need an actual bank account to make contracts and do some other things but it doesn't have necessarily control over over anything um, though at this point right now we do have uh, the the parts of the of the system that are deployed are controlled by a, a multi-signature account, which is like a four of six account that can make and actually set like parameters of the system, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so as a follow-up to that, so what are some some parts to towards achieving that goal you were talking about? Just kind of from a high-level perspective, what's your roadmap look like, I suppose? Yeah, so um, let me just uh, briefly, in the highest level overview, try to explain how we're trying to create this stablecoin. Um, so we have actually two tokens in the system, DAI, which is the stable over the medium and long term. Uh, so there will be some, it's a free floating currency, so it's not like a peg. It's not trying to be a US dollar or a yuan or anything like that. But we do need um, a way to price things. So we price things in... Um, SDR, which is the standard drawing right, which is a basket of the five largest um, currencies, and that's maintained by the IMF. But that's mostly just so that we know how much things cost, right? We, we price them in terms of something. Um, so we have DAI, which is the stablecoin, and MKR, which we call the governance token. And so what DAI essentially is, it's, it's a cryptocurrency that's backed by assets. So very much like the US dollar, used to be backed by gold, you could trade dollars in for physical asset. DAI is also backed by assets. Uh, gold would be a great asset to back Ether, Bitcoin, anything that can be represented on the blockchain that can um, back the DAI, that's what gives it value. Um, and then we require 
uh, over collateralization, meaning it's not just backed one to one, it's backed three to one, four to one, you know, whatever that multiplier is. So there's excess of collateral in the system to back up the die. And the way we do that is we create a smart contract that creates a position. Uh, and what that position is, we call it a, a collateralized debt position or a CDP. So you put your, your collateral in, you lock it up, and then it's, um, it's over collateralized and then it will produce die. And then you can use that die, you can um, buy more collateral, which gives you a leveraged position on that collateral, or you can just um, use it however you would like. But as a die holder, you don't have to worry about creating die, you can just freely trade it back and forth for goods and services or whatever you want. You don't have to worry about it because you always know that it's collateralized. And if for some reason it becomes under collateralized or at a particular ratio, let's say 150%, then there are, are actors in the system called keepers that will liquidate those positions, pay off the debt, and then get a, a slight fee from, for doing so. Um, and, and likewise, if you have die and you want to get back at your collateral, you take that die and you put it back into the CDP, you place a small stability fee, um, and then you can get your collateral back. Uh, now the MKR token, which is important, all those things that we mentioned, like how much collateral do you need? What is that liquidation point? How much um, what is the total debt that can be taken out for any particular collateral type? Those decisions are called like risk parameters. And those risk parameters are set by the MKR holders. And why that's important is because the MKR holders have two functions. One, they make those decisions. And two, they also, all those stability fees, those go to the MKR holders in the form of a, um, so those fees, they buy MKR at the market price and then destroy them. So if the system is running well, the, the people who own MKR are making good decisions, then the amount of MKR is going to be continually decreasing and increasing the price, right? But if there is a one particular token or type of collateral that just completely goes to zero, let's just say um, Ponzi coin, right? So the, the, um, the, the MKR holders thought Ponzi coin was a great idea and should back up a, a bunch of die and that goes to zero because, right, it's a Ponzi scheme. So what happens there is MKR is inflated, and that is used to sell at the market, and that gets uh, for good collateral to pay down that debt, right? So that you can um, you have skin in the game as MKR holder. If you make bad decisions, you get inflated and your price goes down. If you make good decisions, then the supply of MKR continually decreases, which should um, increase the price. So that's a high level overview of what uh, the mechanics are for Maker. And that all happens uh, autonomously with smart contracts. All of those things that we talked about, um, that happens on the blockchain. So there's no like top-down uh, structure imposed about any of those parameters. Okay, so so you mentioned you know the actors and things uh -huh. like that. So those are all represented by smart contracts. Right. Yeah. So uh, if you think about a, a decentralized autonomous organization, Bitcoin actually might be a great example of that. So you have miners as actors. You have full node runners or people who validate transactions. Um, you also have people who move the tokens around, exchanges. You have all these different people with different incentives to kind of make the system work. Well, it's the same idea with, with Maker, but the outcome is a stable cryptocurrency, not just um, a speculative currency. Yeah. OK, great. Yeah, then that's it's starting to make more sense and come together in my head. Yeah. All right. So I, yeah, ideally, hopefully, if the market um, matches also supply and demand, right? Because uh, if people want to think more, the collateral is more important than the, the coin, then the supply is going to decrease, right? And then if they think, um, no, there's actually an uh, opportunity here to create, like I've got more, like when the, when the ETH price just goes way up or Bitcoin goes way up, in that position, you could issue more coins, more stable coins if you wanted to. So you can also, um, that's how we, control the monetary supply. It's, it's a market, it's essentially, be, instead of like an arbitrary number like 21 million. We didn't come up with it. There, there, there could be an infinite number of die, but we don't know how much are gonna be there at any given time. Right, okay, That's yeah, that sounds good. So um, again, kind of back to the roadmap, how much of this is actually in place and functional, yeah. and what kind of time frame are you looking at for this system to be fully operational? Great, yeah, so we have uh, MKR, that governance token is live now. And we also have that um, it's freely traded on decentralized exchanges at the moment. So 
Um, I think Ether Delta has got lists MKR as well as our own homegrown exchange called Oasis Dex for a decentralized exchange. So you can go and um, purchase it now. So that is that is currently live. Uh, we have a, f a specification for the system, like a mathematical specification, similar to what Ethereum did with their yellow paper, and that's how they created multiple implementations of Ethereum. Whereas like Bitcoin has one implementation, right? It's core or whatever. Um, so we have that. We have that specified so that this is generalized and can be re-implemented the business logic almost on any blockchain, really. Uh, that's done. The core components that were used to create the constellation of, of uh, contracts that make this up, a lot of those pieces have been audited, uh, sometimes twice. So we have two security audits. Ideally, uh, well, actually, what we're aiming at right now, where we're, we have a proof of concept um, running right now on LiveNet called Psi, which is basically like simple stablecoin. Um, and the reason it's simplified is because um, it only has one collateral type, Ether. And something we didn't mention, but remember when we said we had uh, we have to know the price of things. That also requires price feeds, right? So that that's a point of trust in the system. So we control um, the price feeds. So it's simplified in that manner, and it can also be caged or like an auto settlement or a global settlement for the simple stablecoin. So um, the, that drastically simplifies the mechanics, but otherwise everything else is still the same. And that is live now. So that's an Ether-backed stablecoin. And we're using that to like pay our, our developers. And we're using that to sort of test out and make sure that these market mechanics actually work like we think they're going to work. That's live now. We're trying to get that available to a larger beta audience within the next several weeks or so. Uh, We'll have to decide how much we want to be able to, because we can also control how much can be issued. That would be called like the debt ceiling. Um, after that, we uh, we really think it's important to have a really good code. So our code will be formally verified before it goes live. What this means is that it needs to be um, so formal verification is is a pretty uh, new realm in in Ethereum. There's a couple different ways to do it. There's some functionally based ways or potentially even like linear logic uh, ways to doing functional programming. I'm not going to pretend like I understand a lot of the formal verification because it's 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 pretty magic stuff actually. But we've got a group of, of people that do and that are working on formally proving that the code is going to do what it's supposed to do. So you're not going to have DAO style um, bugs in it where you can potentially have massive drains of capital because of a bug in the system. Because um, we think we think stable coins and hopefully die are going to be so important to the ecosystem that it's going to be almost as important as like the cryptography that underlines all blockchains, right? So it's got to be bulletproof, really, really good. And we think we've got a path to doing that, but that's going to take uh, a couple months. So the roadmap is looking like end of the year, hopefully we could have a die ready. If not, I mean, I don't like to give like hard deadlines, but our roadmap has. Q4 in it. We actually have a, a roadmap that we put out. Um, but right now we have a proof of concept ready, almost ready to go into beta. We have a, a specification. Uh, MKR has been live for a year and a half, almost two years maybe. It was one of the first ERC20 tokens out there. Um, and it's currently being exchanged and traded. So you can um, get it if you if you think that's a good uh, thing. And, and of course, we've had a white paper on uh, that specifies all of this that we've been talking about even further detail on on our website. Uh, so another thing that I like to ask people is um, kind of what is your personal story? How did you get involved in this? Um, how did you get involved in cryptocurrency in general? And also as a follow-up to that, what does the future look like to you just in the blockchain industry and uh, cryptocurrency in general? Yeah, so my story is I think pretty typical. Um, I caught the the Bitcoin bug in 2013. Um, I I'd heard about it a couple of years before, and, and kind of had slowly followed it. Um, but really, it got me like hook, line, and sinker about 2013 or so, where I started kind of buying some little bits of Bitcoin here and there, playing with it, figuring out how it worked, and really got convinced that this was, you know, the future of how our society is going to work. Um, from there, uh, I have a, a e-commerce background, a corporate e-commerce background, and uh, I was interested in payments and um, things like that. And I, I never really saw Bitcoin as a really great option for payments because the price fluctuated. So I was kind of looking around for um, other options, and I came across uh, Maker, and I kind of basically just volunteered um, through the like the chat and where where people kind of 
gather and coordinate on stuff and eventually kind of took over some running some meetings here and there and got more and more involved to the point where it's my full-time gig. And uh, yeah, the kind of the rest is history. Made a lot of friends, started a meetup group here in Seattle for Ethereum enthusiasts. Um, yeah, but it, it's, it pretty much it consumes everything that I do, everything that I think about. Um, and I think the future is very bright for blockchain technology. I think, um, I think all of society could potentially port over to this type of, of tech. It's, it's that disruptive and that transformative, um, empowering billions of people to, to interact with each other on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. So I think that's really important. Um, and I think some of the big unsolved problems uh, or things to be worked out still in blockchains are things like scaling a blockchain, right? Where Bitcoin can do you know maybe a few transactions a second. Ethereum can do a bit more than that. Um, to really get to global scale, we're gonna have we're gonna have to get something well beyond like even the Visa and Mastercard type of transactions per second. You know, maybe even billions or trillions of transactions a second. If we're, if we're and that doesn't necessarily have to be on one blockchain. I don't think there's gonna be one blockchain to rule them all. I think um, interconnectivity and um, you know, internet of blockchains and things like that are gonna kind of emerge, and um, and hopefully it's it's gonna be really important um, for everybody. But in that same sense too, I don't know that the normal person on the street is gonna know they're using you know blockchains. It's gonna be like, I mean, if you ask somebody, do you do you use TCP/IP? You know, they they're, they're not gonna know what that is, but they use the internet, right? So I think uh, blockchains will also be similar like that. People will know that they can own their own money as opposed to having it at a bank, but they might not necessarily know how that works at a deep fundamental level, and I don't think that's necessary. So yeah, I think the future is bright for, for blockchain and, and uh, blockchain tech. So there you have it. I told you Kenny could explain it much better than me. Um, so check out MakerDAO, that's M-A-K-E-R-D-A-O.com to find out more information about Maker and about their stablecoin. Um, so while you're here, I actually have a couple other interviews with organizations and projects involved in the decentralized organization space. Um, so check those out. I'll link to those here. And thanks for watching. Have a great day.